the diagnosis and treatment of diseases. I hope that after you finish watching, participating in these webinars, I, I hope there will be some logic to how I've organized the information. So we're going to talk today, tonight about how do you figure out you know, what's going on, what's wrong, and then how or what you would treat that problem with. So we're going to talk about diagnosing, figuring out what disease or what disease condition or what issue is causing the problems that you're having, and then talk about treatment. But the important thing to understand, and I think anyone who's raised any kind of livestock already knows this, is sometimes we can't identify the disease, sometimes we can't figure out what caused it. Very often, all we can do is treat symptoms. The animal has a fever. We treat it accordingly. The animal, you know, it's losing weight. It's not eating. We do this. Sometimes we never know what caused the problem. Sometimes the problems seem to come out of nowhere. And it makes, you know, it makes things challenging. And what I usually tell people when they go through a difficult time, when they experience a lot of, say, losses, that hopefully you can learn something from it for the next time or maybe for someone else who experiences something similar. I struggled a little bit with how to organize tonight's presentation. And as you can imagine, diagnosing and treating diseases is a huge topic that could be covered and, in, you know, we send people to vet school. They study this for four years in vet school, and we're going to try to summarize some of it in 45 minutes. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the different ways that we can diagnose, confirm, think we know what's going on with an animal that's ill. And I'm going to talk about each of these things I have here. Clinical signs or symptoms, a physical exam, a case history, response to treatment, blood testing, other things that we can run tests on, and then ultimately a necropsy. And they kind of go in somewhat of a logical order. The picture you see here is uh, the goat had an abscess. We're aspirating that abscess, and then the pus that's inside of that syringe would be used to test to see what organism caused that abscess. We figure out that, we can figure out what to do. So that's a perfect example of, of using a test, in this case in what I classify as an other test, to figure out what's going on. You can't do that for all diseases. Okay, we're going to start with clinical signs. One of the things, um, there's a joke that in vet school, um, vets are taught sick sheep seldom survive, the four S's. They're not taught anything about goats, maybe they are now, but sheep have a reputation of kind of being born to die. And, and I actually believe the opposite to be true. But the reason I think they have gained that reputation is because they do not show clinical signs very quickly. They do not show them you know, in an obvious way in many conditions, in many situations. So as a shepherd, it's very important that we observe our animals and that we notice when things are off, when things are different. When we have a small number of animals, it's not that hard. You practically know the behavior of every animal in your flock. You know you know, you look at this list of things that, that you need to look at and consider, you might know this animal in all of those situations. In a larger flock, we have to really key on the exact things we're looking for. One of the biggest um, symptoms that an animal's not feeling well is a lack of appetite. Because let's face it, sheep and goats are always hungry. And you feed them and they want more. So when an animal goes off feed, that's a sure sign that it's not feeling well. Behavior. Sheep and goats, especially sheep, are a herding, they're herding animals. They have a strong flocking instinct to stick together. So if one of them's off by itself, 
there's a very good chance there's something wrong with it. The last ones that come in when you round them up, those are probably the ones that would be most likely to have something wrong with them. And of course that's particularly useful when you got a large flock or herd when you can't really look at every single one of them but you know those last couple coming in, the last couple ones coming to the feeder, there might be something wrong with them. Watching how animals walk. Uh, you know, obviously limping is one of the uh, most common symptoms that there is something wrong. Uh, recumbency, animals that lay down too much, that's not normal. Uh, body condition, if an animal's losing body condition, and it, sometimes they lose body condition because nutrition's kind of on the lower, you know, sometimes we go through periods of time when nutrition's not as good. Sometimes it's even acceptable to lose body condition, but usually it's not. And when they new, lose body condition, it could simply mean they don't get, they're not getting enough to eat, we need to feed them more, but it could definitely be signs of diseases. Any kind of dis discharges, you know, whether we're talking the nasal passages, discharges from the vagina, anytime we see hair or wool loss. Now, we do need to preface that with hair sheep, that's going to be somewhat normal. But uh, it isn't normal for a wool sheep. Uh, it can be a sign of disease, it can be a sign of some nutritional problems, it can be a sign of, of uh, you know, the same thing with a goat with hair loss. Always looking at their poop. I have to admit, um, people. Some people look at poop too much, but you do need to look at it. You want to um, look at the consistency of it. Uh, they're not always going to have perfectly um, formed pellets, uh, but when it's um, you know too loose, especially when you can't um, attribute that to diet, um, that could be a problem. Diet does have a lot, a large influence on how the the poop looks like. The color of the mucous membranes, and here again we're, um, we're, talk we're um, specifically talking about that lower eyelid, what we would call a FAMACHA score. Um, when the mucous membranes are pale in color, it's a sign of anemia, which can be a sign of the barber pole worm. Any types of lesions in terms of um, some of the uh, things like, you know, fungus and, and in external parasites, uh, sore mouth, Obviously, abscesses, any type of swelling or fluid buildup, an indication of, um, you know, an infection, uh, pus. Uh, most times when you see like an abscess or a growth or a, a knot, you can usually tell by feeling them whether they're probably full of pus. Um, pain, is the animal in any kind of pain? Um, one of the, the best indicator of pain is uh, grinding their teeth. Um, typically, if they're in pain, they, they grinding their teeth can be very common. You can also determine pain by by palpating things, and, and if the animal shows any winces and shows any sign of pain, how the animal breathes. This is just some of the things you look at. It's not completely inclusive. I think somebody in the chat box mentioned, yeah, an eye discharge. Uh, just simply the way they hold their head, their tail. When an animal's uh, ears are drooping, even if it's a droopy-eared animal, you can usually tell. Um, a goat's tail is going to be up unless he's either not feeling well or maybe in some type of, um, you know, stress in terms of, of um, being handled or something like that. But for the most part, if the tail's down, that can be indicative of health. So there's just a lot of things that we can look at and that we can tell when these animals are off. Some of them, just simply uh, looking at their clinical signs is all we need to determine what's wrong with them. There's a lot of diseases that, that have very specific, you know, um, symptoms in terms of how they look and, and how they behave. We don't even need to go any farther than that. So here's a, some examples of diseases that we can typically diagnose simply by looking at the clinical signs. Now, I wish I could ask everybody if you had any questions about any of these specific diseases, and I guess you could put it in the, in the chat box, but a lot of these diseases we diagnose from the clinical signs and then we determine the appropriate course of treatment. Some of the other ones we combined uh, the clinical signs with maybe some other things that we're going to talk about, some other testing that we might do, some response to what we treat them with. But a lot of these we can just tell by examining the animal. Bloat's a perfect example. We're going to see a kind of, they're going to be big on that left side where the rumen is. Floppy kid syndrome. It is just like it sounds. That kid is like a wet noodle. 
grass tetany, it's, it's kind of neurological, it's a magnesium deficiency. Hoof diseases, we're going to th see things like, well, it's going to start out as a limp, and then, of course, we're going to examine the hoof itself. Listeriosis, we call it circling disease because they essentially walk in a circle and they won't even, they're, uh, it's a neurological type disease. It's caused by a bacteria that's common to the environment, most commonly associated with moldy feed, especially silage, but not just that. But they won't even, if you stand in front of them, they won't even go around you. They're just, they basically do circle like if you have in a pen. Mastitis, of course, is uh, an utter infection. The meningeal worm is another one that shows uh, neurological type symptoms. In fact, that is one disease that you cannot diagnose other than um, clinical signs and maybe looking at a case history. <clears throat> Milk fever and then pregnancy toxemia, a couple one, one on the other side of the column, um, looking for clinical signs, uh, late pregnancy diseases. Uh, combined with case history, and there are also some other uh, some other testing that can be done. Uh, ovine progressive pneumonia, uh, you typically can't diagnose that just by clinical signs, but you combine clinical signs with some, some testing and you can figure it out. Polioencephalomalacia, which is basically a thiamine deficiency, um, you know, they go blind. Uh, they stargaze. It, it, again, it's neurological. Some of these diseases look the same, and that's why often um, we actually figure it out when we see how they respond to treatment. Prolapses, well, that's kind of obvious. Something sticking out that shouldn't be. That's pretty easy to see. Uh, Scrapey has very distinct symptoms. Again, another neurological disease. Of course, this one's always fatal. It's also a pretty significant disease that's, that you have to report to the authorities. Gets its name Scrapey because the affected animals used to scrape their, their wool off. Uh, but there's a whole list of, of neurological type symptoms with Scrapey. But you'd also look at case history, and there's also testing. Sore mouth. Um, sore mouth, I say, is obvious. But on the other hand, every lesion that looks like sore mouth isn't always sore mouth. Uh, tetanus, lock jaw, they lock up. Um, that one we usually diagnose by looking at them. Urinary calculi, when they got uh, kidney stones uh, in their urinary tract, they can't pee. So we can usually tell that. White muscle disease, um, it's like a muscular dystrophy. There are different types of white muscle disease, but the one that affects the muscles, they kind of uh, stand arched. Um, very often we, um, we can diagnose that by looking at it. This isn't necessarily a completely conclusive list, uh, but this does uh, give an idea of uh, some of the diseases that we're most likely to um, diagnose by what the symptoms that we see. Of course, um, physically examining the animal is extremely important. Anytime you suspect any animal isn't feeling well, you need to give it a physical exam or take it to the vet and let them do a physical exam. Very first thing you do is take its temperature. It amazes me how many people call me up or send me an email and have a sick sheep or sick goat and haven't taken the animal's temperature. The normal temperature of a sheep and goat is between 102 and 103, and if we extend you know, go a little wider range, about 101 to 104. Goats tend to be just a little bit higher than sheep, um, but that's normal. So if you take a temperature of an animal and it's got a temperature of, you know, 103, it's normal. It doesn't need an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory because it's not running a fever. Next thing I would do, particularly in the locations uh, and the time of the year where worms are a problem, is I'd pull down that eyelid and look at the color and give it a FAMACHA score. One is, is red, doesn't need dewormed. Five is pale as a ghost, white, and needs dewormed. Next thing I would do is I would assess body condition. Uh, poor body condition can be a sign of, it's, it's a very generic symptom, but it can be a sign of, of many, many things. And it's when we start combining these systems, symptoms that we're able to figure out um, what might be going on. Again, getting back to looking at the poop. Not only looking at the poop, but maybe you can't see the poop right now. So look at the butt. Dagginess means fecal soiling. How much poop or diarrhea is, is on the butt, is on the hocks. That might give us a little bit of history of what's been going on. 
And then things like heart rate, respiratory rate, rumen activity, you can evaluate those. Those are the kind of things that the, that the vet is going to look at. Again, listening to their breathing, seeing if, you know, what's going on there. And then you just, a very close inspection of the animal themselves. We're looking for something that shouldn't be there, whether it's an abscess, uh, swelling on the knee or joint, that the animal's in pain, the animal has some sort of obstruction, there's something going on with the skin, you see evidence of an infection, something, again, a, a discharge, something that's just not normal. Those are some of the things that we need to look at to do a physical exam. Like I said, the ones at the top being key. You know, don't ever, or if you need to call your vet, you, you have a sick animal, tell them those kinds of things. You know, definitely tell them if the animal has a fever. But these things are all going to help us, um, you know, to figure out what might be going wrong. Okay, so here's a bunch of diseases that we usually can diagnose after we do a physical exam. And sometimes it's hard to separate clinical signs from kind of the physical exam. Arthritis, bloat, club lamb fungus, dystocia, which is just basically difficult births. We can tell some, we can tell when a, a ewe or a doe is in distress, but it's usually not until we enter the birth canal that we figure out, oh, well, it's a breech birth or, or the head is back or there's something going wrong. Same thing with ring womb, and ring womb is when the cervix fails to dilate. So when you examine that animal, you're not going to be able to get very many fingers through that cervix. Epididymitis is a... Um, inflammation of the epididymis, which is around the testicle. Obviously, when, when you inspect the testicle, you'll be able to determine that. Uh, external parasites, um, you know, in a close examination of the skin. A hernia, you're going um, to see evidence of that. Uh, there for a couple of years, I, I was having rams that would develop scrotal hernias uh, when they were about a month old. And what would happen is, that scrotal sac would get huge because their intestines were going down into there. And then as they got bigger, it got even even bigger. And of course, there can be umbilical hernias and things like that. Um, limping is the first sign that there's a hoof problem, but it's usually by examining that hoof closely that we see whether we've got foot rot, foot scald, or maybe an abscess. Uh, mastitis, there's some clinical signs in terms of um, how the ewe reacts, whether she lets her lambs and kids nurse but it's when we actually examine that udder. Uh, we touch it, we feel if it's warm, we feel hard spots, we try to get milk out of it when we figure out um, you know, what might be going on. Not sure why I have <laughs> OPP there, although hard bag, a uh, type of mastitis can be a symptom of that. Pink eye, um, you know, looking at that eye. And a lot of times I won't be the first to admit we use the term pink eye almost collectively for anything wrong with the eye. And we almost always, with the exception of entropion, which is an inverted eyelid, we essentially uh, treat pink eye the same or, or any type of eye problem the same. Uh, pneumonia requires us taking temperatures, listening to breathing, um, things like that. Skin diseases, again, require close inspection. Uh, sore mouth, at least the beginning stages, require us to, to look. And then urinary calculi, um, you can, you know, by examining um, the prepuce and the, and the you know, that the anatomy of the male, you can sometimes figure, you know, determine that diagnosis as well. Okay. Case histories are useful for diagnosing disease problems. And to me, there's ex this is um, extremely important when you're working with a vet or working with a diagnostic laboratory. Because when somebody, or even, even um, discussing it with any type of expert or even just another a friend who's a producer is a lot of the diagnosis needs to make sense from the standpoint of the case history and I start by talking about the weight age weight age and I think I meant status of the animal you know obviously only a pregnant animal can have pregnancy toxemia um, certain things make more sense under certain circumstances you need to think about what other animals have been affected by these symptoms have there been some other deaths? Have you seen some other symptoms? One of the first things I ask people when they, um, you know, they email me, my sheep or goat is sick, and, and they don't tell me much else. After wanting to know, you know, you know, the first thing, the weight, age, and status of the animal, what, is, what are you feeding? What are you feeding? Um, 
because two of our major diseases this time of the year or are associated with breeding or pregnancies is pregnancy toxemia and milk fever and, and, and you really do need to know uh, the feed management. Um, a lot of times people start having problems and well you want to know what's changed what's or maybe they changed the feed or moved them to a new pasture or somehow they're managing them different. Uh, we'd like to know the vaccination history. Um, some diseases are hard to figure out like um, take for example overeating disease. If you vaccinated for overeating disease and you did it properly um, you'd be less inclined to think that's the problem going on. Whereas if you didn't vaccinate you would be more likely to consider that as a problem. Any type of treatment history, um, what you've done to the animals, how other ones might have been treated and recovered, that sort of thing. And then anything to do with reproduction, you know, new, new male, you know, things like that is what are all of the things that are kind of behind the scenes. And so when you just, when you think about it yourself, when you discuss it with a vet or you just or you take an animal to a, a diagnostic lab to get a necropsy, you need to think about this entire case history. Now some diseases we're going to diagnose typically based on symptoms, clinical signs, what we see, the case history, but we're not positive, we can't make a definitive diagnosis. So sometimes we're able to confirm a diagnosis based on how the animal responds to treatment. And these five, these diseases up here, what I'm going to say is when you treat these animals and they get better, you, you just feel like you're just the smartest person in the world. Because if these are the diseases that you have and you give them the appropriate treatment, they usually tend to get better. Again, getting back to this time of the year in milk fever or pregnancy toxemia, this was a sheep I had, I don't know, about 14 years ago. And um, it was hard to tell whether it was milk fever or pregnancy toxemia. The symptoms can be very similar. I actually will admit that I diagnosed it on the basis of, well actually I used multiple diagnoses, multiple tools. I looked at the case history and the case history was that these sheep were being fed um, whole barley, uh, hay, a mixed hay, and free choice minerals. And so I thought, well, they're definitely getting enough energy. There's no reason that they should um, be affected by pregnancy toxemia. Pregnancy toxemia is caused by insufficient energy during late pregnancy. On the other hand, the hay they were being fed was not a very good quality hay, and it was mostly grass. So it probably wasn't contributing a lot of calcium to the ration. Barley is very low in calcium. Well, they had free choice minerals, and they seemed to be eating them. But I guess a couple of ewes didn't. And so it made sense that it could be milk fever. Okay. But if you're not sure whether it's pregnancy toxemia or milk fever, they will, you know, you can tell by how they respond. So the treatment for pregnancy toxemia is energy, glucose, dextrose. Okay. The treatment for milk fever is calcium. It's amazing how quickly a ewe responds to calcium particularly if it's given, when they're, when they're fairly far along in the disease, you actually have to give them calcium via an IV, and it's like it brings them back from death. So those two diseases look very similar, but they respond differently to treatment. Polio, I mentioned. Polio is a thiamine deficiency, vitamin B1. Uh, they go blind. Uh, they kind of stargaze. Again, it's a neurological type disease. If you give them thiamine, and, and I mean thiamine, I do not mean vitamin B complex because it really doesn't have enough thiamine in it. They will, it's amazing again how quickly they will respond. Now of course any disease can be so far along that they don't respond to anything. But for the most part if you catch these diseases early enough they will respond. And I noticed in the question, as far as tr next week we're going to talk about more specifically the individual diseases. If you notice, I've been lumping a lot of them together. But we're going to talk specifically about milk fever, about pregnancy toxemia, and how you would go about treating those. Because sometimes, you know, when, you know, answering the question in the chat box, if milk fever is far enough along, you're going to have to get an IV in them. If you catch it earlier, uh, we can put calcium uh, under the skin subcutaneously. And then also you can give oral calcium. So it just kind of depends how far along you go. Same thing with pregnancy toxemia. You catch it early enough and you give it oral 
supplements of energy, usually propylene glycol, which we're going to talk about today. Again, under the skin in an IV. And then even in, in a worst case scenario, you actually do a C-section to get the babies out. Uh, grass tetany, a magnesium deficiency, they're going to respond to that. Floppy kid syndrome, which is basically a metabolic acidosis, they're going to respond um, to sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. So these are very specific diseases that, that we end up or maybe end up diagnosing as a result of how they respond to treatment. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, tests that you can do. Laboratory tests for the most part, but also some that you can do yourself. Okay, fecal tests are a very important diagnostic tool for small ruminant producers, without a doubt. And I want to go into a little bit of detail uh, on this slide. You can use submit fecals um, basically when you're trying to figure out if you've got some other type of parasite going on usually, some other type of, uh, you know, diarrhea. Um, for example, giardia, you would submit a fecal and that might, could be identified. It's not that common. And then Yoni's disease, you can um, test a fecal to see if they are shedding the bacteria. It's not going to tell you that the animal is sick, but it's going to tell you that you have that infection on your farm and that that animal is shedding the bacteria. Okay, in the left-hand column, these are all the different tests that you can do pertaining to gastrointestinal parasites. And here I mean the stomach worms, the lung worms, the tapeworms, the flukes, and the coccidia. Okay, all of them. Okay, the first test that you can do, or have done, you can do it yourself, and is typically what most veterinarians do, particularly with dogs and cats, is they do a simple fecal flotation. Um, and what that will do, you mix the feces, with a, um, with a solution that will cause the eggs to rise to the top, and you'll be able to look at that slide underneath the microscope. What you'll be able to tell is you'll be able to differentiate between the strongyl type worms, which are the stomach worms, the round worms. Uh, coccidia will look different. Uh, tapeworms will look different. Okay? If you live in an area where nematodirus is a problem. That's a, another strongyl type worm, but it has a really big egg. You can differentiate that. You can only get a general idea of, of the level of infection, because I want you to keep in mind on worms, parasites, coccidia or stomach worms, it's not whether they are infected, it's the level of infection, because it is the level of infection that tells us whether or not we need to treat them, whether we have a problem, whether we need to change management. So the simple fecal flotation is of very limited value. Okay? Because what we really want to identify is not tapeworms versus strongyl worms versus coccidia. We want to be able to separate the strongyl type worms. Okay? And then again, we want to know the level of infection. So the next test would be a fecal egg count. It would be prepared very similar to the flotation, except that you would weigh the feces and you would weigh um, the solution. Okay? You'd, it'd, be an, it'd be a known amount of feces, a known amount of flotation solution, so that you could calculate the eggs per gram of feces. You would use a special slide, as shown in the picture there. It's called a McMaster slide. Now, there are different ways to do fecal egg counts. The most common method is called the modified McMaster technique, and that is shown in the picture there. It has the same limitations as the flotation. You cannot identify the different types of strongyl eggs. Yes, coccidia, yes, tapeworms, yes, nematodirus, but not the difference between homonchus, which is the barber pole worm, telodorsasia, and trichostrongyles. Those are the three main worms. We cannot differentiate at that level. So typically, if you take a, a sample to a diagnostic lab or to a veterinarian, um, what they should be telling you is you have this many eggs per gram and they're strongyl eggs or oocytes. So we can also do a fecal oocyte count. How many oocytes, and that's basically the coccidia egg per gram of feces. So, you know, we can identify coccidia. They do look differently. Okay. And you can, you can send samples away, take them to a veterinarian, take them to a diagnostic lab. But you can also learn to do these for yourself. It's not that hard. Uh, you need a minimum amount of equipment. And there are various uh, resources online that can tell you how to do this. When I teach my FAMACHA workshops, we include fecal egg counting as part of it. Okay, 
The next test is called the fecal egg count reduction test. And basically what that is is this kind of a pre and post treatment comparison. So I would take a group of animals, I would take a fecal sample, and then I would deworm them. And then 7 to 14 days later, I would take a second sample, and then I would compare those two to see if that treatment was effective. So I can use that to determine whether a dewormer was effective, um, or even maybe I want to try some sort of natural product that I think might have potential. I could go through the same process to see if it was effective. Because to be honest with you, when I look at um, the tests that you can do for fecals, it's really the fecal egg count reduction test that's probably the most useful. Because as we talked about last week, to decide whether an animal needs dewormed, we primarily want to look at the FAMACHA score, body condition score, bottle jaw. We want to look at the clinical symptoms. And so the best use of fecal egg counts is to see if the drug was effective. So I think I kind of spotted out of the corner of my eye, the purpose of the FAMACHA system, yes, is to only treat those that require it. But if I need, if I want to figure out if the dewormer I'm using is effective, I'm going to have to do deworm some more animals. An alternative to doing the before and after fecal egg counts, and I don't have to do any deworming, is what's called the drench right or larval development assay. What they do with this test is you submit a pooled fecal sample, preferably from animals that you think would have a higher egg count, and you send that sample, and actually the University of Georgia is the only place that does it, and they will hatch the eggs, they will look at the eggs and look at the larva and identify the kinds of parasites you have, and then using the larva, they'll test for drug resistance for all of the drugs that we have. For the fecal egg count reduction test, you have to do it on every drug, but you could do it on one animal to get an idea. With the uh, drench right test, we're, we're able to test for them all at one time. Someone had asked a question about doing fecal egg counts. All you really need is a microscope. It needs to be at least 100x power, so 10 on the eyepiece, 10 on the magnification. You need that slide, that McMaster slide, which is about $25. Be sure to get one with green lines. You need flotation solution, which you can actually make of saturated salt or sugar solution. And then you need fairly minor things like a scale, uh, pipette, or syringe, you know, things, uh, beakers, things to, to work with the fecal solution. That's about all you need. Okay, the next test is called a fecal copraculture, or basically larva ID. We do this in our buck test uh, every four weeks. We send a pooled sample, they hatch the eggs, and from the larva they tell us what type of parasites we have. So we'll know that we have 90% homonchus contortus and 10% trichostrongyles. That's some useful information to have because that tells me that I can really rely on FAMACHA scores or, and, and that philosophy to determine who needs dewormed. The last test is called the leptin staining test. I don't think it's widely used. It's only two states that do it, Oregon State and University of Georgia. Um, and um, what they do is, um, and I think leptin's the wrong word. It's the wrong word, but it's a, they use this, something from the peanut, and it, um, they're able to tell you the proportion of homonchus in a sample. Homonchus, the barber pole worm, is, is our biggie, and knowing the, the, the proportion that that makes up is very important, so that test can be done. I have a lot more detail on a lot of these different tests, and I'm actually contemplating putting it in this presentation, but then I figured out it, I already struggle with not making the presentations too long. But, um, but there, is th there are things that we can do with fecals. I will honestly say that, that, that the most important thing nowadays for working with uh, parasites is knowing what drugs work, and most people don't know that. And that's where the fecal A count reduction test and the drench right test can come in handy. Um, blood testing uh, can be done to make and a diagnosis, it can, in some cases, it can be the only test, but um, in a lot of cases, it, it's used to confirm a diagnosis. So everything from um, homonchosis, uh, barber pole worm, as I mentioned, packed cell volume, 
is an indication of anemia. That's technically a diagnostic test. Uh, we can do some testing for CL, uh, CAE, OPP to see if they have antibodies uh, to those diseases. Um, floppy kid syndrome, again, it's a metabolic uh, acidosis, so that can be looked at by doing a, a, a blood test. Uh, milk fever will be low blood calcium. I had that done on that U that I showed you. Uh, she had low blood calcium. Um, you know, pregnancy toxemia would be low blood glucose. Um, you can do blood to see if you've got some deficiencies or toxicities in minerals, but you're far better off doing tissues like uh, kidneys and livers. And Sandy Carr, um, that percentage is correct. About 20% of the animals harbor about 40% of the parasites. Okay. Then there's a lot of other different tests for a lot of different diseases that you can look at. Acidosis or indigestion, you could technically check the pH of the rumen, but um, I don't know. I think I'd probably treat the animal before I'd wait for the results. CL, the absolute best test for that is to culture that pus. Um, club lamb fungus, you usually don't need to test, but you could do hair and skin samples. Epididymitis, um, you're kind of testing before you might see clinical signs, and that's some of the case of these things, is you would test before you see clinical signs. Listeriosis, the symptoms are really obvious, but you could do spinal fluid. Same thing with mastitis, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the California mastitis test would be uh, somatic cell counts. Um, I'm trying to talk loud uh, and clear into this microphone. I hope it's doing better. Uh, you can also test the milk to see what uh, antibiotics that organism is sensitive to. That's probably more valuable uh, than the somatic cell counts. Uh, pregnancy toxemia, you'll find ketone bodies in the urine. Again, we tend to diagnose that based on clinical symptoms and how they respond to treatment. There are a couple of live tests for scrapie. They're typically only done when a flock is believed to be exposed or infected. Uh, one is a rectal biopsy and the other one's the third eyelid test. Skin scrapings, you can do uh, uh, to determine some skin diseases. I think a lot of things that have to do with nutritional toxicities and deficiencies, there's a whole slew of tests we need to be doing here. Tissue culture. Uh, liver and kidney are going to be a lot better indicator of mineral status uh, than, a, um, than a blood test. And then looking at feed, water, soil. Um, just to share with you, I was having a mysterious problem with my sheep the last couple of years. I'd lose lambs, some, some lambs right after weaning. Well, last year I tested the feed in the water. Okay? The feed had some mycotoxins in it, but it was, that's fairly common but the water tested off the charts for E. coli. I had a couple of necropsies done, livers tested marginally deficient on copper and high, marginally high on molybdenum. So all of that was really valuable information to help me diagnose my problem. Um, some diseases ultimately can only be diagnosed by a necropsy or a post-mortem exam. And at the same time, I'll tell you that even though that's true, it's every time you submit a sample, you do not always get a cause of death. Sometimes it can be very difficult, particularly with abortion. But if you have uh, losing too many uh, animals to abortion, being born dead, um, you need to submit to fetuses and the fluids. Hopefully you'll get to a diagnosis. Um, caseous lymphadenitis, uh, a necropsy would show the internal abscesses. Coccidiosis would show typically nodules on the small intestines. Uh, enterotoxemia can sometimes be diagnosed um, by necropsy, particularly uh, what happens with the kidneys, listeriosis, lungworms, meningeal worm um, is going to be diagnosed because they find it uh, in, the, in the central nervous system or based on the damage to the neurological tissues. Some plant toxicities, pneumonia, polio, rabies, scrapie, and worms, all of those potentially diagnosed uh, by necropsy, but again, um, it's not always going to be definitive. It can be very frustrating when you submit an animal and you don't always get a diagnosis, or you don't even have confidence in the diagnosis because it doesn't um, match the clinical signs, it doesn't match the clinical history. But no matter what, all of the data and the information that they provide can be used to help you make a diagnosis. Uh, just a couple of words about uh, necropsies, if you experience too many unexplained deaths, you should submit to a diagnostic lab. The fresher, the better. One of the lambs I submitted last year died on Sunday and I had to toss her in the freezer. They could only do certain things with that carcass. Again, the importance of providing a clinical history. 
Ideally, you work through a veterinarian. And as a producer, you can learn to do on-farm necropsies, particularly what I saw, I guess Cornell called a digital necropsy. They step-by-step -step tell you what to do and what to take a picture of, and then also harvesting tissues for testing. I know the next time one of my animal dies or I have it butchered, I'm going to take livers and kidneys so I can get a mineral status. Okay, treating diseases. I'm going to talk about anthelmintics or dewormers, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, other injectables, other medications, home remedies. And the last thing I have on there is homeopathic remedies. I want to say I'm not going to cover that because I don't really have that expertise, but I'm also not going to discount it. And um, like I said, I can only cover so much in an hour, so I wanted to talk about some of the strategies for treating these diseases. Got some pretty uh, elaborate tables. And um, this first one is on anthelmintics or dewormers. These are the uh, dewormers that we use that are approved for sheep and goats. And that symbol that's a pie was actually supposed to be a check mark. <laughs> um, and what, I, what it means is that if you look at cydectin, it is effective against roundworms. It is um, not sure about lungworms because it's not on the label. It's effective against the L4 larva. It's effective against the hypobiotic larva. Um, that X, uh, it's not labeled for external parasites, but it may be effective. And then the next column shows the resistance level. The four asterisks means the highest degree of resistance. And two means it's still largely effective. And then who is it approved for? In this case, only sheep. Uh, there's a, you can obtain a copy of this by downloading um, the PowerPoint presentation from SlideShare. Then you can do with it what you want. I've got lots of tables with dewormers. I seem to be doing this all the time. Um, and so that's what each one of these means. Each color is a different group of anthelmintics. When they're resistant to one in that group, there is cross resistance. The take home message here is there are differences in these products. There are different levels of resistance. And there are different degrees of approval by FDA. The, the dewormer at the bottom, Zolvix, is a new one. Uh, doesn't have any resistance. Uh, it's just not available. We're waiting for approval. Just a reminder, when you, when you do identify an animal as being parasitized and it needs to be treated, you need to administer these drugs orally with drench formulations using a syringe with a long metal nozzle. Goats tend to, not tend, goats should be given higher dosages one and a half to two times the sheep dose. One and a half is for levamisol. Two and a half is for all other drugs. For the meningeal worm, the deer or the brain worm, the uh, drugs of um, choice are fenbendazole and ivermectin. Drug resistance is a huge problem. It varies by geographic region. It varies by farm. And the only way to figure it out is to test for it, fecal A count reduction test or the drench right assay. This is a really big table, and I don't expect you to sit here and read it all. It can be a reference for you if you download uh, this table or download this PowerPoint presentation. These are, anth these are antibiotics. When do you use an antibiotic? You don't just throw it at a sick animal. You should use it because there's a fever, because there's an infection. It's not, LA-200 shouldn't give, be given to every animal that goes off feed, okay? This table shows what some of these antibiotics are used for. More importantly, it shows which ones are FDA approved for sheep and goats. OTC means over the counter. Therefore, you can buy it at a feed store. You can buy it through the internet. RX means prescription. Even if you can buy it over the internet, you require a veterinary prescription. The use of extra label drugs is not your right. It's a veterinarian's right you'll see that very few of these drugs, one, neomycin is proof for goats, one. Okay. No anti-inflammatory drug, with the exception of aspirin, is over the counter for sheep and goats, or FDA approved for sheep and goats. They all require prescription. And when we've got an animal with fever, we've got an animal with an infection, we've got an animal with pain, uh, Anti-inflammatory drugs are very important. We need to work with a veterinarian to use these drugs. A couple of important things. Aspirin is something you can use on your own. Dexamethasone is a steroid and can cause um, abortions. The copper oxide wire particles, 
was one example where a medication was given by age. All the medications are typically given by weight. And keep in mind, none of the drugs that, if they're not approved, there's going to be no dosage on that label for goats or sheep. Other uh, products that we use that are injectable, uh, BOCI, uh, which is selenium and vitamin E, uh, by prescription only for sheep and goats. The cal dextro and the calcium, those are for treating uh, milk fever. Those are some of them, some of it's over the counter. Epinephrine, everybody would ideally like to have some of that on hand. It's for allergic reactions, which anytime you give a drug or a vaccine is a possibility. Uh, just some different things to have around. Uh, vitamin B complex should definitely be something that you have around. Um, it helps stimulate appetite. So there's a lot of different uh, needs for some of these things. Uh, other medications and treatments, and all of these are over the counter. Uh, Peptobismol, they make it in a big gallon jug for sheep and goats. It's very, it can be very effective at treating non-infectious causes of diarrhea. Same thing with kaopectate. Uh, no withdrawal period on these drugs. Mineral oil is one of the best things you can have around. Um, Nutridrench, great for um, giving nutritional support to those that are highly stressed. Uh, probios, um, again, to an animal that's highly stressed, that's off feed, that has diarrhea, helps stimulate appetite. One of the most important things to have around is propylene glycol that you see in this picture. It's a source of energy. It's a treatment for pregnancy toxemia. Red cell is actually a supplement for horses. Uh, we commonly use it as a supportive treatment, particularly for goats um, when they're severely parasitized. Uh, Therabloat treats bloat. Zinc sulfate is the drug. I'm not going to say so much a drug, but the product of choice for treating foot scald and foot rot in a foot bath or a spray. Uh, common home remedies, some of the things I give most common are just things I got in the house. Yes, OTC means over the counter. OCT means October, I guess. It's probably a typo. I'll often use an antacid like Mylanta if, if they've got uh, gas, uh, bloat. Uh, baking soda mentioned uh, for treating um, that floppy kid syndrome. A lot of people put it out on a regular basis. Uh, corn oil, uh, you can use that to make a, a, your homemade Nutri-Drench. Gatorade, a source of electrolytes. Honey is a source of energy. Caro syrup is a source of energy. Again, you can make a Nutri-Drench out of it. Uh, molasses is a source of energy. Pedialyte, electrolytes, vegetable oil can be used to treat bloat. And yogurt, kind of like the probiotics, uh, can, it restores healthy bacteria to the rumen. Uh, you know, when animals are off feed, when you need to stimulate their appetite, all of these things can be used. And like I said, I, I do respect potential homeopathic remedies. I'm just not um, qualified really to discuss that. I think we'd need a veterinarian who specializes in that, and that'd probably be a good source subject for a webinar. Because one of the issues is I know there's folks out there that are interested in organic. And, I, and I'll say a couple of things about organic is, you know, largely you can't use at least the drugs we've talked about. You can use the stuff that we see here. But organic standards do require you to treat a sick animal, so you may still end up using some of the drugs. You just can't sell them organically. But with the increase in organic and just the overall desire not to use a lot of drugs, and I know that's my desire, but I want to use it when I need it, um, you know, I think we're going to, we need to look more at some, some other remedies at times. And I think the research community is, is, is addressing some of that. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is extra label drug use. And you'll have to forgive me a little bit because I'm probably going to get on my soapbox just a little bit. The reality is very few drugs are FDA approved for use in sheep. And even fewer in goats. And you know what? It's probably not going to change that much. It's probably not. And so as a result, we depend on the extra label drug use to treat our animals. Not to treat them wholesale but to treat that individual one. Occasionally it needs to be wholesale. You know, coccidiosis might need to be treated on a wholesale basis. You have an abortion storm, you might need to be able to uh, administer a drug on a wholesale basis. But sometimes we just want to be able to treat that specific animal. You know, he's got a fever, he, he's got a respiratory problem, and I want to be able to treat that animal. And what I want you to understand is if you use a drug, and we're going to use penicillin here as an example, in any way that is inconsistent with what's written on that label, then it has to fall under the extra label drug use. Okay. So you use a drug for a different species. Actually, I, could, I, I guess I used, if I deworm a goat with cydectin, that's going to require extra label because cydectin is not approved for goats. If I give goat penicillin, penicillin is not labeled for goats. 
extra so it's extra label. If I used a different dosage, okay, if I gave safeguard to goats, and I double the dosage, which you really have to do because the company will even admit that you have to double the dosage, um, that's extra label. That's not on the label. Okay. In the case of uh, the penicillin, most veterinarians advocate a much higher doses of, of penicillin than is on the label for sheep. That's extra label. They can do that. If I give that drug in a different manner, if if you can't see it on this label, but penicillin is only approved for intramuscular injection. Well, I can tell you, because I've consulted with veterinarians, that I only give it subcutaneously. I also, through this problem I mentioned that I was having with these lambs, where they were having digestive abdominal distress, my vet suggested that I give some penicillin orally. Again, that's his right, but that is or requires extra label. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about extra label drug use. That is not your right as a producer. The only one who has the right is a licensed veterinarian to administer, prescribe, or dispense a drug extra label, period. You, you do not have that right. And so in order for the vet to be doing it legally, there has to be a valid veterinary client-patient relationship. He must know about that animal. He must know about your situation. He must have working knowledge of your farm. It must be your vet. The animal's health must be threatened. An example I often give of, um, there used to be a lot of research done with trying to synchronize estrus in sheep and goats and trying to induce estrus out of season. Well, until cedars was approved, it is, they are approved for sheep and will soon be approved for goats. None of that was legal and none of that would ever be legal because it never met the requirements of extra label drug use. You cannot use a drug because you want to improve performance. PG 600, which sometimes accompanies the use of cedars, can never legally be used. It's a violation of the extra label drug use law. It doesn't have anything to do with their health. So in order for them to prescribe a drug extra label, there can't be an alternative either. There can't be an approved drug that contains the same active ingredient in the required dosage form and concentration. For example, a veterinarian legally can't prescribe Cydectin injectable for sheep because there is Cydectin drench. He would have to prove that that meets those requirements, which he's not going to be able to do. So under no circumstances can Cydectin injectable really be used for sheep. These drugs, when they're used, we have to use a substantially extended withdrawal time. Whatever withdrawal period is listed on the, on the label is immaterial. Different species, different dosage, different route of administration. It's immaterial. And I'll give you a perfect example. I'll go back to Cydectin, injectable. The withdrawal period for that in cattle is 30 days. The recommended withdrawal period for goats is 130 days. Different species, different everything. And then, of course, no drug can be used that's going to create a residue. The animal that's most guilty or found to have illegal residues the most is goats and it's often deworming products, often the ivermectins and the cydectins. So just keep in mind, as you work with the vet, because I'm going to assume you're going to do that, but when you're using these drugs, make sure you really follow that extended withdrawal period to protect yourself. And then the last little thing that, that I want to say about this issue is um, it, you know, having a veterinarian is, can be challenging. All locations don't have ready access to veterinarians, don't have ready access to veterinarians that have small ruminant expertise. With that said, we also have to understand that the use of antibiotics and animal drugs is, is being scrutinized. And we need to make sure we use these drugs properly. So we need to make every step we can take to have a veterinarian whether that means working with a, a, a young vet, um, you know, a young vet that's, um, that, that is willing to learn about sheep and goats, or whether it's a cow vet uh, that you can talk into him, or whether it's your dog and cat vet that you start talking to. You've got to cultivate veterinarians because we need to make sure we use these drugs properly. Legally, yes. But I would say even more important than legally is properly. 
and you do that with these much extended withdrawal periods and and not giving dosages and routes of administration that you just you know draw out of the air you know you never should in, take an injectable product and and give it orally unless a veterinarian prescribes it that way all right off my soapbox